My section is on spine instrumentation, and I'm going to try to cover it in half an hour, which is a little bit of a tall task, uh, given that there's so much to it. Uh, but I, I'm going to move pretty quickly. Um, uh, essentially, I wanted, wanted to cover the history of instrumentation very briefly, because there's a lot in it, and there's a lot of learning points with respect to where we've come from and uh, what we've achieved. And it, I think it dovetails um, Dr. Kwanko's talk well in the sense that there, there are significant evolutionary um, improvements in our instrumentation that allows us to do a lot more. I want to cover biomechanics very briefly. It's really intended for the neurosurgeons, much more than our orthopedic colleagues. And that includes a discussion of basics such as anchors and longitudinal members. Um, I, I want to focus on the clinical mechanisms of failure and what it is that, that we're trying to avoid, and then briefly talk about tips for success in terms of of uh, how we achieve our goals. So very briefly, um, a correction of, of deformity has really been with us for a very long time. Uh, it really started in ancient days where uh, deformity was recognized and the concept of traction, distraction came along and these were found to have some um, uh, benefit with respect to the deformity. So early on we understood that alignment was actually important uh, and, and we did our best with respect to the uh, medieval tools that we had. Um, talking about medieval, uh, this was a uh, picture uh, taken in the time of Lewis Sayer, who wrote a book on suspension uh, for correction of deformity, which is effectively distraction, except that he would fix it with plaster of Paris. And uh, it, it looks painful. Uh, I'm sure it was. Uh, but he must have had some success, because it built on Again, built on this evolutionary uh, understanding of distraction uh, and traction as, as, as helping deformity. And of course, you know, it, it's the muscles that do the work here, uh, isn't it? Um, they, they add as much to the correction as the underlying uh, distraction between the vertebrae. Um, this has been around uh, for a while. Of course, uh, casting came along, and there were different forms of casts uh, to help achieve what, what uh, correction was achieved. Um, uh, to, to my incredulity, the cast even existed when I was a fellow, uh, when uh, Dr. Chapman uh, subjected us to placement of a Rizzer cast. Uh, but uh, to my uh, astonishment, there were good outcomes, and um, there, there is definitely something to be said for placement of a brace once, uh, once uh, deformity is corrected, but in particular, a cast to help with uh, temporary correction of deformity. So uh, this leads leads us to a couple of kind of major sentinel um, moments in, in our history. Um, and I, I, I don't want to get into Dr. Har Harrington's uh, kind of um, uh, uh, really discovery uh, with respect to his instrumentation, because we'll cover it in a few slides. But suffice it to say that in, doctor, in, in 1963, Dr. Eurist and colleagues made a major discovery by identifying bone morphogenic protein as being an intrinsic protein that exists in the spine and in other uh, axial skeletons in the body, which was a necessary conduit to arthrodesis. And this was isolated uh, in the years to come. Recombinant bone morphogenic protein was hard Harvested, and now it's a great tool in helping us achieve uh, arthrodesis where and when it is appropriate to apply it. Dr. Uh, Harrington uh, was really the first to use instrumentation to uh, correct uh, deformity systemically. And he did this by placing large, uh, wide, or thick calibered rods, stainless steel rods, and he was typically anchored on either side of a deformity with hooks, and there was distraction, and it was very, very effective in correction, typically of a coronal deformity such as scoliosis. Of course, what it did do was create kyphosis across the apex and led to flat back deformity, which is uh, something that we, we, we've recognized. But at least in the plane of coronal deformity, it achieved its goals, and this was 
a, a, a significant finding because up until this point, instrumentation hadn't been systemically applied to correct the deformity. Uh, and we still see Harrington rods to this day, um, not implanted, but, but of course when we uh, need to uh, revise them or, or revise some aspect of the instrumentation in patients who come back. Lukey uh, further evolved the technique by uh, presence of this kind of uni rod uh, that, that was bent around the spine and he utilized sublaminar wires or uh, pedicle wires uh, to bring the spine to the rod and in doing so corrected, helped to correct uh, globally uh, the deformity as well. Uh, this was coupled with the Galveston uh, connector or Galveston extension of the Lukey rod, which which was placed into the ilium for additional fixation. And again, in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, this was, this was a revolution in terms of strong distal pelvic fixation. The problem with the Galveston rod is that it was subject to windshield wiping and it often uh, wouldn't have a strong fixation uh, and it would come undone, need to be revised. So then we, we got into the concept of segmental uh, fixation. And really, uh, Cottrell and Dubousset uh, came along, and, and again, there was another major step forward in terms of understanding this concept of global derotation. The deformity was a three-dimensional uh, uh, issue and that it needed to be corrected in that three-dimensional plane. And instead of uh, purely manipulation of the spine back and forth, the rod was derotated and in doing that, uh, further deformity correction was achieved. They used cross links to share the load between sides. Uh, they had powerful uh, distractors and compressors, uh, both in the sagittal coronal plane to do in situ bending, uh, and uh, they achieved their goals. Of course, there was significant stress on the instrumentation, and instrumentation failure was common. But uh, I believe Dr. Dubusset has actually been here to visit Seattle Science Foundation, and, and certainly there's, there's there's great heritage in, in, in what they did. Nugent, yeah. um, what, what is, I don't know if you're gonna to get to this later or not, what is your current perspective on crosslinks? Yeah, I hate them. Um, I, I don't uh, use them at all. Um, I think there is some, maybe there is some uh, argument to be made with load sharing uh, to, to share between um, uh, to add two sides of the longitudinal members. But the lamina is the crosslink, in, in my opinion, in, in most cases now. Um, that, that's my argument for it. Tyler's about to answer, correct? No, no, David, hand me the microphone. So um, I don't use them in, in deformity constructs. Uh, I don't think they add very much. With pedicle screws, um, it's, it's really pretty solid. I use them in circumstances where I have a long segment laminectomy defect, for whatever reason, over the cord to protect it. Yeah. All right, just to keep muscle from falling on it. So I yeah. put one across there just to keep soft tissue from falling on it. That's the only time yeah. I actually use them. And it's interesting you say that because the, the, the one or very few cases that I've used it has been for that very exact reason. Um, but uh, the lamina is the natural crosslink uh, if it's preserved, um, if not the body. So, so then came, came uh, the evolution of the CD instrumentation and there was not just use of hooks, but the, the placement of a fixed screw. Uh, so it was a screw that was placed straight ahead in one direction. Uh, it was a lot easier to assemble than the multi different parts of a hook and a wire system. Uh, seating of the rod was difficult, uh, but uh, it, it, it was better than before in terms of getting segmental fixation. Uh, and and it, was, it was a great way to fix uh, instrumentation to the spine. Um, uh, but and, and you can see the evolution here uh, below all the way to the Moss Miami system, uh, which I think was uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Harms and uh, Schaffelberger from Miami uh, and Moss. So cantilever became a, a technique that was used also in, in correction of the deformity with a long uh, longitudinal member such as the rod. 
Then came this plethora of offsets uh, which helped to fix the spine uh, eventually to, to the instrumentation because the fixed screws didn't fit perfectly with respect to the deformity. And um, along with that came polyaxial um, units such as connectors and washers and, and, and so on. And, and there was a million and one of these things, for example, in the uh, Texas Scottish Rite system, the TSRH. Uh, as I mentioned before, Moss Miami um, had the benefit of not only stainless steel, but also titanium, and it introduced polyaxial uh, uh, screws uh, where there was movement of the head and there was some uh, increased leverage with respect to fixing the rod uh, to the screws, and it significantly decreased the fiddle factor. Uh, and uh, we recently revised one of these, and, and it's a bear. Uh, and typically, there's an inner and outer washer uh, that you need to, to be aware of, uh, and it can be seated deeply within the bone, so it's still, still a bear. Then, uh, in addition to the, the polyaxial nature of the screws, uh, there, there became uh, the ability for the shank and, and, and uh, the screws to be modified. So there was different pitches uh, with respect to the threads uh, also, uh, and uh, things improved with, with constructing the assembly of the instrumentation. Uh, then, in, in addition to segmental fixation, we understood the role of compression and distraction to further correct uh, the uh, deformity across a concavity and convexity. And uh, we definitely uh, shared a load um, through semi-rigid systems, and we'll get into that in a sec. Then Dr. Suk from Korea uh, was the first to place thoracic pedicle screws, which weren't approved by the FDA uh, till significantly much later. But he demonstrated the concept of uh, being able to do global derotation uh, with fixation across several screws uh, across the apex of a deformity, in addition to segmental uh, derotation techniques. Uh, but, but he championed that, and of course it's caught on uh, extremely well following osteotomies and, and posterior release of the spine. And so it, this is all to say that there's been a stepwise increase in um, flexibility and the ability to use different systems to achieve our goals, which is, which is releasing the spine, then placing instrumentation that we have contoured uh, prior, and then allowing the spine to be corrected to the contour of the instrumentation and the shape and the size uh, and, and the type of instrumentation that we selected respective to, to patient suitability factors. Um, this slide points to, to the fact that it wasn't just instrumentation, but it was also classification as well of uh, deformity systems that also evolved all the way back from 1948 uh, when the concept of coronal deformity could be measured through angles with Cobb uh, all the way to Lenke, and there's modifications with Lenke's system, Uribe, and, and so on and so on. So it's really been surgeons that's pushed this system forward. It's not, it's not just been industry. Surgeons have been at the helm of modifying instru in, uh, instrumentation and, in, and uh, uh, working with industry to achieve what's best for patients. And part of that, of course, is spinal pelvic parameters, which you heard a lot about uh, with Dr. Conco's uh, um, lecture and the ability of integrating that with the instrumentation that we have to, to achieve our goals of balance as part of deformity correction. So we've talked a little bit about the history of the spine. I wanted to talk about the uh, purpose um, of, of, of the spine and have that lead into uh, where it is that we are with instrumentation right now. So this is all pretty obvious. Firstly, the spine protects the neural elements. We know that it has a covering for the nerve roots and the cauda equina and the spinal cord and so on. It's part of the appendicular skeleton, so it stabilizes our external limbs and it supports our body weight, but also it provides a, a measure of stability for locomotion or movement uh, as well. So then, that's the purpose of the spine. What about instrumentation? The, the, the role for instrumentation is to help 
us achieve normal balance again when there is disease. So when we have conditions of deformity and trauma and infection and tumor and degenerative conditions, the instrumentation, if correctly applied to patient to the, to the specific patient, will bring uh, that the the spine back into its ability to do what we just discussed. The other point that I want to make is that instrumentation is only good until the biological cascade of fusion is achieved. And, you know, it's a race between instrumentation and its failure and that of the biological cascade of fusion being achieved. So where instrumentation fails us is if it's load to failure, cycle to failure, brittleness, duct ductibility and, and, and so on, all the factors that make up the intrinsic inherent factors of strength for, for the rod and screw system fail us before fusion is achieved. Or the patient has specific factors which delay fusion and that isn't achieved. And so I, if, if there's one take home message, it's really this. Okay, so what's the ideal instrument? So it has to be strong, we know that, it can't fail us because it has the goals of, of, uh, of achieving stability for the patient. It's gotta help us restore normal alignment, particularly in deformity. We have to be able to easily insert it into the spine. It can't be complicated, or it can't be complicated, but it, it has to be user-friendly. It can't fail us with respect to back out or fracture, so in other words, its inherent properties have to be stable. Um, it has to allow us for correction in multiple planes, and we should be able to use it to correct multiple planes of fixation. It's gotta allow a generous surface area for fusion to occur, so it has to have a minimal footprint. Uh, and it's gotta be cost effective, so our hospital systems will, will allow us to use it. So this, this brings us to kind of a, a basic, very basic biomechanics, and I, I, I guess I don't want to get into its, its uh, main details here, and for the orthopedic guys, uh, th this, this is the time that you can sleep because I know that it's been repeated in your education, uh, but for me it was eye-opening as a neurosurgeon. But, but essentially the concept of the uh, instrumentation is that of the longitudinal member, which is typically a rod, and the anchor, uh, which is a horizontal uh, uh, screw. And the interplay between these typically allows a moment arm slash cantilever effect to occur, which allows for stability. And, and basically, uh, it goes like this. From the skull down, from the occiput down uh, to your sacrum and pelvis, there is increasing axial load on each segment of the spine, which increases as you descend in terms of levels. So the, in the lumbar spine, there's significant axial load, which is applied from above. This is, in, in, a, in a neutral state, this is resisted by a shear force, which is a combination of the muscles and the ligaments and, and the vertebrae itself, which resist it. And when the two are neutral, they balance each other out. The, the um, fulcrum of the, of the meeting or the coalition of the axial, uh, of the anchor, of the horizontal anchor and the longitudinal member, which is the rod, creates a uh, rotational force known as an instantaneous axis of rotation along that fulcrum. And that instantaneous axis of rotation is not only dependent on the load, but it's also dependent on the distance between the tip of the anchor to the fulcrum itself. So for example, short screws or higher vertebrae where, where there's a smaller distance between the, the, the tip of the vertebral body and the pedicle where the fulcrum is typically results in a smaller force. And that force is known as a bending moment. That's the name that we give it in the spine, a bending moment. Now bending moment in those short screws or small vertebrae is very little and it's not resistive. But when they're placed in combination with each other across a long construct where there's multiple anchors or multiple screws, the bending moment forces become significant. And they become significant because they resist failure or they resist deformity. And the next 
slide that I, that I have, um, or we'll, we'll get to, really displays the clinical benefit of what I'm talking about. So with respect to a vertebrae, here's the vertebrae, here's the screw, there's C is the applied load from above, B is the resistive force at the level of the fulcrum, there's an instantaneous axis of rotation around that fulcrum, and that in combination with the distance to the tip of the screw creates this bending moment, right? So the screws act as, if you like, a load-bearing beam to, to, to create, to, to resist the, the forces around them and create a significant bending force. The magnitude of this force, as we said before, is a combination of force from above times the distance from the fulcrum. The, the moment is generated by stress applied by the, by the body of the screw behind the fulcrum. So again, it's, it's really a matter of distance behind, behind that fulcrum. So, and this is exactly what, what we said before, that, that at, for a single level, that bending moment is small when it's placed in combination with implants uh, of a long construct, it's significant. What I'm getting to is this point here, and that is, that we know, and you, you've heard it, I'm sure, before, uh, and you'll hear it again, that deformity typically begets deformity. And, and why is that? Why, why, why is it that we have a, patients that have a curve, there is you know, a coronal curve or, or, or something that, that exists in, in adolescence, and these patients survive for several decades, and when they hit their 60s, typically, what happens is the deformity starts to go, and within a very short period of time, they become very symptomatic, and they present to you as the adult deformity patient. And they've been symptomatic for just a few years with respect to the length of time in their lives that they've had a deformity, such as progression of a long-standing scoliosis. And it's because of this principle here. And again, it, it's, it's what we talked about in reverse. So with a, with a deformity, what happens is that we have an axial load that's applied, a bending moment is created ar around that point. As the kyphosis increases in a deformity, what happens? The force that's applied starts to increase because as the kyphosis increases, the distance between the tip or the front of the vertebrae, that anchor, if you like, increases to the fulcrum, and it creates a vicious cycle, but that creates a moment. It's increased for, for as the deformity increases. There's an increased bending moment, and it leads to more deformity. And if you, if you don't understand the physics of it, because I explained it poorly, just remember that deformity begets deformity. And so the goal of the, instrument, of the instrumentation, or what we hope to achieve, is to reverse that by reducing the deformity, and in so doing, correcting the deformity at a segment or across several segments, we improve the ability of the spine to withstand further force, further moments, instantaneous rotation around the fulcrum and prevent uh, further collapse or, or further application uh, descent into deformity. So all of this is, is based on a couple of kind of simple um, uh, concepts, and, and, and that is the stress and, and the strain. You've, you've, you've all heard of this. Um, I don't want to labor it. Uh, time is short. But basically, um, there's a very important concept uh, when it comes to bone or implants and so on, and that's the relationship between the two. Stress is force per unit area. It's typically measured as pascals in the metric system. In when it, as it relates to the vertebrae or bone, there's three kinds of force in particular. There's compression, which uh, is, is intuitive. There's distraction force, which is known as tensile uh, uh, force. And then there's shear, which is force that's applied at an angle. And they have different uh, responses in vertebrae uh, or different strains with respect to the type of force that's applied to bone. Strain is the, res 
response of that object, the response of the bone or the implant to the stress force that's applied. And it's measured in a ratio, and so there are no units. And basically, it reflects the ability, the force um, uh, resisting ability of the material to these forces. So the, the, the one thing about that relationship that you want to know is this curve here. And it's the stress-strain curve. If you had any um, uh, training in engineering or, or, or physics or material science, you know this curve uh, backwards. But basically, the area of the curve that we're interested in is the area between B and C, which is known as the elastic zone. Uh, and Hooke's law tells us that an object is able to deform and uh, un uh, or reform depending on the force that's applied, according to this. And so there is typically a relationship, a direct relationship between the stress, the stress forces that are applied to an object, such as bone or an implant, and the response, the de deforming response, which is known as strain. And between these two, there's a linear relationship. At C, you, we lose that ability for this linear relationship, and there is breakdown uh, of, of the response of that object to the stress forces. And at D, there's complete failure uh, when, when a material fails completely. And the slope of that curve is known as the stiffness or the elastic modulus, the Young's modulus of, of, that, um, of that material. So for example, when it comes to bone here, you see that the elastic modulus of the bone of a 21-year-old male, healthy male, is very different to that of an 80-year-old osteoporotic female. So stress required for failure is significantly lower in the 80-year-old compared to the 20-year-old. And this is extremely important when it comes to how we handle the spine and the decision making of the implants and the instrumentation that, that we use for, for these two patients. So going through it quickly, the strength or the section modulus, the, the strength, the stiffness of a screw, for example, is also related uh, in, in this linear fashion. But in this object, it's related to the inner diameter. It's an exponential function of the inner diameter of, of the screw. We talked about this. Um, I, I think the main thing to take away is this, is this kind of table here. And that is that bone has a certain elastic modulus that ranges within the 7 to 30 uh, gigapascal range for cortical bone. Cancellous bone is obviously less than that. And so if we want to place an implant or in, an instrument, such as a rod, we want it to approximate the bone of the patient that we're hoping to, to fix or to correct the deformity for. So something like peak has a small elastic modulus. It resembles bone. Titanium is higher. Um, cobalt chrome is much stiffer uh, compared to titanium. And so in the interplay between failure of bone or the instrumentation, the, the higher the elastic modulus, the greater the difference between that and intrinsic bone, you can guess what will fail. There are also other characteristics to our implants, too. And um, uh, this, this kind of s sounds like a list of your you know, uh, Olympic traits. Uh, but basically, the ductility of an implant is its ability to undergo a large amount of deformation prior to failure, brittleness, the elastic ability up until failure, strength, we've talked about the, the degree of resistance to deformation, uh, fatigue failure with respect to cycles and so on, how many cycles does it take for an implant to fail, um, notch sensitivity, very important with respect to rods, and we'll talk about this briefly um, in, as it, in particular as it relates to titanium alloy, um, tensile strength, how much uh, what's the maximum st stress that an object can withstand before it breaks? Uh, toughness, um, amount of energy per unit volume that can be absorbed. Roughness refer refers to the surface uh, material uh, of, 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 a, of an implant, particularly for inner bodies. It's very relevant now. And we talked about Hooke's Law. 
So the other thing about bone is that its elastic modulus differs according to the force that you apply, to the direction of the force. So it's, it's weakest when it's applied at an angle and strongest when it's applied uh, with compression. And that is because the fibers within the vertebrae are laid down in a way that they're vertically oriented. So they're most resistive to a compression style force compared to that of an angle. And so uh, that impacts the way we place instrumentation, for example, when it's placed posteriorly versus laterally or anteriorly. And it's important uh, when we look at fractures and, and how we correlate the degree or, or direction of an axial force of a force to, to that of failure of bone. So the rate of loading is also important. That, that refers to its viscoelasticity. Uh, and it, of course, changes with age and disease and use and so on. Wolf's Law, important point. We won't get into it. But, it, but bone remodels according to force. And it adapts to load. All right, so what are the ideal properties of an implant? So this is pretty intuitive. Firstly, it's got to be inert. It can't leach. It can't become toxic. Um, it, it's got to be strong enough to achieve its goals. It's got to be resistant to a lot of cycles to load. It has to have a low elastic modulus. In other words, it has to approximate um, what we're putting it into, which in this case is bone. It's got to resist corrosion. In other words, it has to be able to be placed for, for decades and decades without uh, failure or oxidation. It's got to re resist wear, which is part of the kind of the, the same spectrum. And most importantly, it has to be inexpensive so we can use it. So what are the ones we use? Typically, uh, these are our longitudinal members. Uh, we started with stainless steel. We've evolved to titanium and cobalt chrome. And they're used, titanium alloy and cobalt chrome. And they're used for different occasions. But there's also non-metal uh, instrumentation as well. Ceramics. Uh, polymers, bone cement, these are also things that we put in. And, and they're also subject to the same uh, discussion that we had with respect to stress and strain. So steel, briefly, it's been around the longest. As you know, steel is made up of ferrous and non-ferrous components. Um, the most commonly uh, used form was the 316L, which is the 3% molybdenum, 16% nickel, low carbon content. So wh wh what are the advantages of it? Why we use it? Well, it's very strong. And it takes a lot before it deforms. It's very biocompatible in the body. It doesn't leach significantly. And it's super, super cheap. Problems, as you know, is that over time, it's subject to significant stress corrosion. And it produces huge artifacts on, on any of our imaging. So it's a major pain uh, because it makes it difficult for us to uh, follow up on these patients and, and, and do progressive imaging to, to look at the disease process. Thai alloy. We use it so commonly, it's made up of, of all these different um, uh, other uh, metals in addition to titanium. It's very biocompatible. It's very fatigue resistant. It's low Young's modulus. It's compatible with an MRI for the most part. Um, but there are a couple of disadvantages. It's sensitive to notching or stress placed on deforming and contouring uh, the rod. And there's a technique we'll talk about to, to, to minimize that. Um, and it can actually be, be, be toxic. And they, uh, the, the claim is that it's the vanadium that, that leaches. And it's relatively expensive, at least compared to steel anyway. Cobalt chrome, very strong, higher elastic modulus. So this is the kind of rod that we would place in our 20-year-old uh, male because they have the ability to withstand the stiffness of this rod, and we can do more with it. It's stronger than Thai alloy. You, you, you've used it before. It takes greater force to bend it. It's stiffer, and it's less subject to failure. Um, but it will challenge our bone screw interface. 
and it is subject uh, to failure in patients that don't have the bone density to cope with it, such as those with osteoporosis. And there's other things such as nitinol, which is our metal uh, shape retaining um, uh, 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 instrument, uh, and peak rods, which are used to be great for um, uh, load sharing, but are effectively useless for something such as deformity, uh, because they can't be manipulated or contoured, and, and I think they've fallen out of favor. So this concept about uh, notching. So when we bend a titanium alloy rod, we create micro stresses at the point of where a notch is placed in the instrumentation, which over a period of time lead to points of fatigue failure, particularly because the body is subjecting that tie alloy rod to constant cyclical loads. So the point is, select pre-bent rods, if possible, to avoid that technique and minimize the amount of notching that you require. So, you know, I, I've seen residents take a rod and bend it into different places, look at the spine, bend it back, bend it forward, you know, bend it multiple times, and I know that that's gonna fail. You know, it's like, let's, let's start again, let's have a look, let's make some markers on the rod, Let, let's use some um, judgment ahead of time with respect to where we want uh, the, the bends to be, to be put in the rod for deformity. There are other so, implants. So, Nujan, yeah. th these are so many uh, important points that you're raising right now. So, what are you? What are you doing in your practice? Yeah, I. What, I you yeah. Know, what the seventy-year-old adult deformity lady who whose T-score you know seems okay at one point seven, but we all know that she's yeah. got cemented T8 from a previous compression fracture, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we deal yeah. with this all the time. So what, yeah. what are you using in young people and what are you using in little old ladies? So, so if I can use cobalt chrome, I always use it in young people. I just think that they, they're gonna live longer with that rod system and they, and they can cope with it. But, but for the older folks or for everybody, I, I, I take um, my, my wire or coat hanger or whatever it is, I, I place it on the spine. I get an idea of the curves that exist there. I mark out where I want the lordotic and the kyphotic uh, uh, correction to be. And I make some kind of assessment based on that uh, as to where I need to uh, do, do my correction and with contouring of the rod. Are so, you using cobalt chrome or titanium in the little old lady? Always titanium. That's what I do. You know, it's, fu it's funny. I'm just going to stop for one second because I lived through the error of the cervical spine. We had to be so rigid and we broke everything. And then we went to dynamic plates because we adjusted. And now we've swung back in the lumbar spine that said we have to be so rigid. And the only good thing is for your young guy, I have a junior partner who fills up his OR schedule refusing <laughs> the pseudoarthrosis right. on his broken rods. <laughs> and he's the only one at Jefferson that has broken rods. And so I, I kind of think we might be, I get it. Because he uses the, uh, the uh, chromium. Because the, the ridges chrome. help. Yeah. They don't bend. They snap. But, the titanium, you but, might get away with the pseudo. because yeah. I, haven't, I haven't had a broken rod. Now, my, granted, my patients hate me and they might go to see someone else. But they don't, they don't break the rods. I mean, think about your practice. How many rods have you had that are broken? Yeah, so really? so I, I have to admit maybe I'm a better surgeon than you. That, that I'd love like I'd love uh, the fact that nothing nothing hurts important. your results like follow up. Right, exactly. What what did they say? Sun sunshine is the best uh, you know microscope. Um, so basically, uh, there's two things that I take away that and it complements what you were saying before, and that is that in elderly patients, I don't think you need to achieve the same. There are different deformity correction goals in the elderly compared to younger people. So I'm okay with a titanium alloy rod that has more play in the system because I don't need to achieve the same stiffness for, and, and the deformity correction that I do in a younger patient. The second thing is that I add more longitudinal members. I, I, we're routinely putting a third rod in now. Um, you know, to especially across that L4 to S1 region, which I think is most subject to, to rod fracture. Uh, maybe it's poor arthrodesis on, on our part, but that's where I find my fractures. I don't see them at L2 and above, and I don't see them, uh, you know, between S1 and S2, other than one patient that I put down to mutation of the SI joint, but I'm seeing them between L4 and S1. 
And what are you doing? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I've been in practice as long as some of the people in here. I'm my fourth year of practice, but I, I came out using for deformity mostly cobalt chromium um, and did have plenty of rod fractures. I've transitioned uh, mostly to titanium. Uh, if the really little old lady with poor bone, 5.5, five, I prefer 6.0 titanium just to have some, some rigidity for correction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I you know, do quite a bit of deformity and I have quite a few rod fractures. Most of them were cobalt chrome, but I, I still get them with, and it's lumbosacral junction. We know there's a tremendous amount of failure. Um, you know, so I've, I've been, I think I've been getting a little bit less rod fractures now that I'm doing multi rods across the lumbosacral junction, but mm -hmm. um, and three column osteotomies, but they they still happen. Tyler, so I pretty much exclusively use cobalt chrome. Um, you know, if we look at the history of this, everybody had stainless steel, and then titanium came out, and everyone went to titanium. And the reason stainless steel made a comeback was because the titanium rods were breaking because they notch. Uh, and then cobalt chrome came out, and people saw the advantage of not having stainless steel again because of the, some infection issues and some imaging issues and went to cobalt chrome which definitely can break um but i tend to use i use five five for my primary rods for most i i think six oh is a little stiff for a lot of the deformity patients but i use a pre-contoured uh rod that uh, is bent with for a patient of average pelvic incidence so i don't add any additional bending to that i've never had one of those break yet and uh, and i had a third rod across the lumbosacral junction from l2 ish down to below s1 and and i have not had those fail in that scenario so so tyler in 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 your patient of you know you you've had them see uh, their primary care doctor you know endocrine endocrinology and they're still osteoporotic their t scores minus two would you still put cobalt chrome in in that patient yeah i i um i do so i think the stiffness of the rod uh, cobalt chrome versus titanium. If you look at the actual stiffness, it's not that much different. Um, the yield is different on there. There's a little, the elastic versus plastic zone is different on those, but the actual stiffness, I don't think is that that different. So you're, I don't know that your force on that bone mill interface is as different as you think yeah. it is. Uh, I think it's much more important to get the alignment right, get the contouring right. Mm -hmm. Don't preload your implants. Uh, I tend to use a some sort of transitional strategy on everybody, oftentimes some type of tether to the adjacent segment uh, in a ligamentous augmentation type approach. So, and I don't run a third rod up near that that top of that construct. So um, the only place that's going to fail is at the ends, right? Your, mm -hmm. your stiffening rod only matters at the ends. Um, it's not gonna fail in the middle because your rod was too stiff. It's the bone middle interface on your proximal or distal implants and people generally aren't failing their distal implants if you're down to the sacrum and pelvis solidly. So it's all on that proximal. And if you do some type of junctional strategy there, I think that helps with that. Do, do you think that, that, that this has an impact on PJK, the, the choice of rod? Uh, I think it probably does. If you're putting a 6.0 cobalt chrome versus a 5.5 titanium, yes, I think there's probably some difference. 5.5 to 5.5, I don't know how much that difference really is. And I think a lot of those other factors probably matter quite a bit more, right? I've certainly had my share of PJK, and when you look at the rates uh, we've compared in the past, and I was, I was quoted people 26%, and that's what the literature said, and I was pretty much right there. Um, I did one PJK revision last year, and a lot of scoli cases, so. Wow. Oh, wow, I mean, that's incredible. So, um, I have a different comment here. I think that when it comes to rod fracture, the rod, Regardless of what type of rod we put in, you put in, that rod will fracture if you have pseudoarthrosis. And it will fracture 5.1, it will fracture T12 L1, it will fracture wherever there's pseudo, eventually the rod will fracture. Two rod, three rod, four rod, five rods, I've seen it all. Um, and so the, the key is doing a good carpentry and try to achieve um, the arthrodesis as, as quickly as possible before those rods uh, fatigue and break. Um, I exclusively use cobalt chrome, um, and uh, even in DGEN um, deformity now, I use three, four rod constructs. Definitely three column osteotomies, four rods, non-negotiable um, in those uh, patients. So. Yeah. Um, really uh, good points. More, one more question for, for the faculty. Yeah. Is any, so the, I think the notching phenomenon is an important, uh, really an important uh, biomechanical phenomenon. Has anybody using two benders to avoid notching with French benders, you know, when, when they need extra bend. So if you are got a high PI and the pre-bent rod is, uh, is not quite enough and you have to get a little bit extra 
Are you two bending or are you French bending to avoid notching? I'm, I'm still French bending, just yeah. it's an easier way to get mm -hmm. the bend you really want it to be. Um, right, we know that notches it, but titanium is much more non notch sensitive than the cobalt. Yeah, much more. Yeah. I, I think the, one other thing just for uh, residents is that they're now, um, industry com uh, is now coming out with the ability to pre-bend a rod based on patient-specific anatomy. And so you have companies that are uh, taking both uh, imaging pre-op and deformity correction goals and giving you a rod uh, with, with uh, a pre-contoured rod which is uh, suitable for the patient. Um, I don't have any data on whether it's more effective than than French bending, for example, but it stands to reason that it would be. Um, I don't know if the faculty has any experience with that, but it's an interesting concept. Okay, so just moving along, so sublaminar wires, um, they can supplement our deformity correction. Their goal is to improve the kyphosis by pulling the spine uh, to, the, to that contoured rod. Several disadvantages, I mean, they can cut through bone, they can uh, impact on neurological elements, um, they produce imaging artifact and so on. You can, to some extent, avoid it with the use of braided tape, such as polyethylene tape. Uh, such as a universal clamp. Uh, inner bodies we're not going to go into, uh, but they also have a big role uh, to play uh, with respect to um, the, the disc space. Nowadays, we're moving away from uh, uh, in, implants with pure big windows for bone to form and looking at surface uh, properties of, of the implants and the ability to integrate, to osseointegrate the implant into the bone. And there are different ones. We've talked about screws. Um, I just want to say there's a couple of things here, and we'll close on this. The pullout strength of the screw is related to a couple of things. One is the shear area, the difference between the inner and the outer diameter. And so screws that have greater surface area with respect to the thread surface area will have improved pullout strength, and that stands to reason. The other thing is that the pitch is important, and much less so is the length. Dr. O, Dr. o always used to tell us that, uh, you know, um, size isn't important. It's the angle that you put it in, and um, I think tri triangulation, I, sorry, I had to, yeah. <laughs> but, um, he, he was the one that just put it in my head all those years ago. So basically failures occur for pullout, they occur with fracture of the implants and with failure of cantilever bending. Um, and the pedicle we, we found is it's obvious is much better uh, to, to resist pullout than any other part of the bone. And we'll end with this slide. Pick the largest diameter of the screw that you can to uh, fit the, the pedicle particularly the cortical surfaces of the pedicle. Um, if you can, place cortical screws, because typically, typically they will bite the strongest part of the bone, which of course, uh, with the way the bone is structured, is the cortical uh, compared to the cancellous part. These typically have much greater pitch, uh, and they're placed in a different direction than the classic lateral to medial. Um, there's no additional benefit past 50% um, with respect to screw insertion. Um, angle is important, as Dr. O says, uh, and tapping will create less uh, a, a failure uh, by, by increasing uh, a deficit in the bone. Um, so we typically tap uh, one size down, that, that was the ethos between tapping one size down for cancellous bone and tapping two sides for strong cortical bone. And where possible, you can augment as well. Okay, uh, eventually um, there's three, three things you need to know. You've got to understand the mechanics, you've got to match the instrumentation to the condition of the spine, uh, and, the, and your alignment is key. And if you select your patient well, and select your strategy well, uh, and you're in a place that knows uh, how to do that well, you're going to have good outcomes. Thank you. All right, that was, that was excellent. Thank you very much. Um, any questions for Dr. Kazimi? Go ahead. Uh, just in a slide, uh, just a slide that on Christian, by the way, so people can hear. It turns green. 
Yeah. Uh, just a question. Uh, one more slide. Yeah. So I was just wondering, uh, the part of the screw that comes in contact with the cortex of the pedicle, mm -hmm. isn't that where you should have the highest pitch? So, so those. So I'm referring to screws, the cortical screws that have, that have the higher pitch. So does everyone know what pitch means? It's the, it's the distance between the threads, basically. So uh, those screws have higher pitch, meaning that there's more threads, so less distance between the threads. And uh, yes, so um, that, that's what I meant. Yeah, so, so they, they need to have more pitch across the, the, the cortical part of the bone as opposed to the cancellous part of the bone. Yeah, that screw doesn't have a cortical pitch uh, throughout its entirety. Right. Um, but it is encountering, despite that, that the distal part of the screw is encountering cortex. But you're right, there, there could be more of a cortical pitch to those threads. And ideally, that so, screw would be placed even more securely, so the tip would be closer to the cortical bone and purchase more cortical bone. So that's, that's 